It's been a quarter century since the BLM revamped their grazing program across the country. Today on the county seat, we are going to take a look at what the changes mean, what the revamp could bring, and what kind of problems the old program has led to as we analyze the new grazing program and tell you how you can participate. County Seat is next. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the County Seat. I'm your host, Chad Booth. We are bringing our program to you today from the Utah State Capitol. But it's not state legislative news we are talking about today. This is big federal news. Uh, recently, the Bureau of Land Management has decided to do a system-wide overhaul of their grazing program. And this is something that hasn't been done in forever. Joining us for our conversation today, Troy Forrest, the Department of Ag and Food. He's the head of the GIP program, Grazing Improvement Program. The guy that's on the ground, Tammy Pearson, a rancher and just happens to be a county commissioner from a very agriculturally centered county, Beaver County, and Kathleen Clark, who serves as the head of Utah's Public Lands Policy Coordinating Office and is to run the BLM. How big a news really is this that we are doing a ground up policy change? I, I think it's a big opportunity since it hasn't happened since 1995 and when Babbitt was in charge of the Department of Interior, he undertook a cha to change the rules governing grazing and did so in a way that made it tougher for our ranchers to succeed out there. Uh, but that nonetheless has been the rule that's persisted since then. So just staying on this topic, this was already in place before you got there. How hard is it to try and affect this kind of change? Uh, I put together a team and we went to work to go through all of the hoops to get a rule change, change the regulations governing grazing. We had a very good proposal. Uh, it was accepted by the department. The minute we released it, uh, there was a group that took us to court and said, you can't do this. Interestingly, the judge agreed that of the 11 items, nine of them were fine, but there were two of them that he threw out. Uh, the folks who had filed their lawsuit were not happy with that, and they asked for reconsideration. And in reconsideration, the same judge left us with two and threw all of the rest out. And then I understand after that, it was those two were appealed to the Ninth Circuit, and ultimately they're thrown out forevermore. If, if we've had these grazing restrictions in for a long period of time, I would like to kind of get a bead on how hard it has been under the current operating uh, procedures to really maintain healthy public lands. And Troy, that I'm looking kind of, I'm making eye contact with you on this one. Okay. Well, the problem's been is to, to affect change on your allotment, even if it's positive change that you want to do to make a difference on the ground. It's a five to seven year process. By BLM's own, you know, what they've looked at, it takes them five to seven years to affect any kind of change on an allotment, even if that's only changing the, the turn on date by two weeks. That shouldn't have to be. They can, under a rider they have, categorically exclude and make a decision to renew your permit with all the same terms and conditions. As long as they don't change any, they can do that with a stroke of a pen and you get 10 more years. But if you want any change of any kind on your permit, according to BLM, it's five to seven years at a minimum. And with that level of hoops to jump through, it's often easier for the rancher to say, well, it's close enough. I'll, I'll do what I've been doing because it's easy. I don't have to go through a process that's appealable where I could lose part of my grazing rights. And so that grazer is willing to sign on the dotted line because at least he knows the devil he has. Doesn't necessarily know the devil he doesn't have. So Tammy, as a, as a practicing rancher, um, have you noticed it's, that either the land has deteriorated or, deteriorated or it's been harder to do your job as a rancher in the last 20 years, 30 years? Well, I think, I think what the worst problem was with Babbitt coming in is he eliminated the flexibility that the local range cons had to work with you on your own permit. 
And so kind of like what Troy's saying, you know, if you want to do range improvements and whatever, it's been literally an act of Congress to get those kind of things done. It, it ties up NEPA, it ties up the, the EAs or the categorical exclusions, those kind of things, and that's all time consuming. But even, even some of our things that we could do and some of the comments that we want to make on this new uh, grazing regulation is, is things like uh, targeted grazing and, and rangeland health that they can use the flexibility on a permit. Like when you have a big range of cheatgrass come in and, and bring your whole heart in there and clean it up, that's gonna help with the, the uh, fire hazards and different things trying to get that fuel load down. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk about the opportunity this presents and, uh, and what sorts of uh, things probably ought to be discussed if we're doing an overhaul. We'll be right back with this conversation on the county seat. Welcome back to the county seat. We're having a conversation today about uh, a new plan to overhaul grazing across the entire BLM system, not just at a state, not just at a local level. What are the things that we really need to be looking at that we haven't looked at before? Where are the opportunities lie? I think the prior set of rules and regs that came out of um, the Clinton administration, really we're trying, we we're emphasizing conservation. Let's take care of the land. Let's not worry about the rancher. And they invited external publics that were opposed to ranching to have a larger voice and sometimes a seat at the table or a seat on the bus if they wanted to go out and take a tour. But it, it complicated that. It got rid of the flexibility as has already been mentioned. Uh, it denied, you know, ranchers the ability to have any uh, capital interest in the rangeland improvements they pay for. So we like to see some of that overturned. And I think we also now have scientific evidence that supports the fact that smart grazing can be good for the range. You don't, getting cows off sometimes is the very worst thing you could do. So, agreed. yeah, and, and you know, we've seen, you know, because they have, because the regulations are so onerous now, and a lot of management plans have been the same in many cases now for 30 years, we've had type changes. We've had sagebrush valleys that have now burned in our cheatgrass. But the plan that's written for grazing pretends the cheatgrass isn't there and that it's still blue bunch wheatgrass and sagebrush and it's pristine. We've got to have the ability to change to meet the needs of the land that has changed over that period of time. And we have a, a once in a generation chance to do that, to make meaningful changes where we can respond in real time to the conditions on the range. If a fire happens and we need to remove grazing for a minute and then bring it back at a higher level, we should have that flexibility. You know, in, in Utah, we've got an example where because of one field office, they took the opportunity to make temporary non-renewable AUMs permanent because we had the Milford Flat Fire, the biggest fire in Utah history. It burned a whole bunch of sagebrush and, and pinyon juniper trees, and the state, through an overwhelming effort in conjunction with the BLM, went back in and reseeded that, and there's more forage there. But it took four or five years to allocate that forage to the cows so that they could use it so that we don't have a perpetual cycle of burn. And that's a win-win for everybody because we're using a renewable resource that has been made better, but under the current regulations, it's onerous, it's difficult, it's almost impossible to make those changes in a timely manner. We need to be able to respond. Tammy, I, you know, I had an uncle that was a rancher, and, and he would just see practical things, and he, part of what he had to deal with is National Park Service uh, in addition to the BLM, but... Uh, even back in the 60s and 70s, it was very difficult to get stuff done that you saw a practical solution. Uh, have, you, have you seen situations where the, you've actually gone the wrong direction because of the policies that were put in place and the land has become significantly worse just because you can't do something simple like develop a spring? Yeah, that, that's been uh, problematic, and I think that... Uh Probably the best thing Utah has, and I tell everybody when we're working with the National Association of Counties and our Western Interstate Region, different things like that on public lands, that you know lead, Utah's leading the way with her own WRI projects or program and those kind of things. Um, but there's still that federal, the federal stipulations and regulations 
that, that tie you up in that. I mean, you can't just do whatever you want. It's a, it's a process to go through there and do that. So a lot of the things that, that would be simplified, especially if we make these, com these comments and these regulations are updated, is just regular maintenance. I mean, on, on um, water sources, on uh, the point source, like your ring tanks or your, your watering troughs, different things like that that need to be upgraded and maintained, your ponds that need to be in there. It, it should just be within the contract, with, uh, within the scope of the contract, and your permit to go in there and do those things. Most everybody's permit actually says that, but it's not really allowed. I mean, you still have to go through all these hoops to get just regular maintenance done, and it doesn't make any sense. Well, the, the other thing, you know, Chad, NEPA's been in place since 1976. We've literally done thousands of environmental assessments on rangeland improvements, on pipelines, on seedings, on brush treatments, and those types of things. 99.9% .9 of the time when that effort is undertaken, at the end of it, you get to a finding of no significant impact. If we know that we're not significantly impacting the environment, we've done thousands of these studies that show that, why do we continue to do the studies that are going to show us the same thing and get to the same result? Why do we not categorically exclude that and make it where we know that if we put in a pipeline and trough, it has very minimal environmental effects that are negative. It has a lot of positive effects from an economic and an ecological standpoint. Why do we not make it where it's easy? We've done thousands of them. The BLM has the records of it. Let's go, let's take the records. You know, the last five or six years, they've got e-planning. They can show every one of those EAs. We can harvest that data, look at it, and find, you know, maybe there are certain situations where we come up to significant impacts, and we need to do an environmental impact statement. But let's identify those few situations, whatever they are, and only do the work there. Why do work that we don't have to do? That seems disingenuous to me. Has the science have things that you thought you knew 10 years ago been proven wrong, or at least the regulators thought they knew? Have they been proven wrong? I, I think, especially with us, like our pasture rotations, different things like that, I think that the set time, it's just like your on and off days are set in the spring and in the, in the fall. And those kind of things, depending on the season or the weather that year, whatever, you know, those are the kind of flexible times that we need that the, the local range con should be able to help you with. And that actually leads to a bunch of questions. I want to take another break and come back and readdress, uh, you know, this blank canvas that we have because it seems like there are just a lot of opportunities. We'll be right back with the county seat. Welcome back to the county seat. We're having a conversation today about the uh, overhaul of grazing, not the overhaul of the actual land, but the policies that govern it on federal lands where people have grazing allocations, at least as far as the BLM is concerned. Well, what are you going to change? Flexibility. Make it where local managers can make local decisions. I mean, just because it hasn't rained in Salt Lake doesn't mean it didn't rain in Beaver. And, and the people in Beaver shouldn't have to be affected by a decision in Salt Lake. It should be the local manager that looks at conditions on the ground and says, yeah, your feed's there. Go ahead. Go ahead and go out 10 days early because spring broke in April this year instead of waiting until May. Right. So we should take advantage. Right. And right now, they don't even look to Salt Lake because the rules in place are, are responding to very fixed things, very fixed directives about how to manage the land. And they may make no sense for Utah across the board or certainly for a given grazing area. So I think it is time that we had um, results-based grazing. Let's empower a rancher to be a good steward and see if he can improve that land. And I bet you nine out of 10 cases, they would. Well, yeah, their livelihood depends That's on That's exactly it. right. They would make good choices. Like Troy said, with the local management and being able to be flexible on whatever you know the needs are for that permit, mm -hmm. um, the one one of the biggest concerns I think that we have is on the grazing rigs is who who are the interested parties and who are the you know who are the people that are allowed to make the comments right, and so we had this conversation a few years ago and. I kind of, you know, lost my mind a little bit in the, in the conversation. Um, 
because the, the comment was made is that, that uh, their shareholders or stakeholders, you know, is basically every man, woman, and child in the, in the, st in the nation. It ha can make a comment on my permit renewal or my chaining or whatever's going on. And I says, that's not, I mean, that can't absolutely be true. That can't be one of those, those issues. Or, you know, that can't be possible. And it, it absolutely is since Babbitt. I mean, that was one of the, com the changes that he made. And so um, I think that, that the affected parties or the affected interests should be someone that it actually is on the ground and that has. You had Western interests at heart when you were the director of the BLM. I did. You, you, you were educated in this area. You understand uh, land management and grazing. What would make your job as a director easier to make sure that we are treating the land you know, correctly and maximizing? Because I look at the pictures on the wall behind you. Anytime you improve grazing for cattle, you're improving conditions for wildlife as well. And, and, and the that, resource and itself. Well, I think ideally you get Washington to get their hands out of it and you delegate authorities for range management and oversight to the local field offices. They know what's going on. They ought to be developing personal relationships with the ranchers, they ought to go ride with them. I, man, I suggested that when I was at BLM and they said, we haven't seen horses in years. <laughs> well, it's about time you saddle up and get to know the people. You're affecting their livelihoods, their lives. Your job is not just about getting rid of them to presumably protect the land. They have an obligation to work with the rancher as co-stewards. So I'd push authority out. I would too, and, and I think the thing that we forget sometimes is the Taylor Grazing Act was set up to give preference to those that were already here, to reward those settlers that had taken the time, made the effort to establish a ranch. Those rights were documented and made, made whole through the, the Taylor Grazing Act. That was the whole intent, is to apportion the range to make it fair. We forgot that in land management now, is that those were the first people here. Those, those preferences, those permits, date back to pre-BLM times, before the BLM was here. And there, there is an investment there, a generational investment by those ranchers and those ranch families that we need to take into account. You know, the American public, they know if you want to get into the movie, you've got to be one of the first 500 people in line in order to get into that auditorium to see the movie. We understand that concept. Ranchers were here first. They're the ones that blazed the trails into the West. They got here. They established the communities based on their ranches that, that we all live from. So they, that preference needs to be recognized as we promulgate regulations that affect their lives. Because it's the economic basis. The, the federal government made a promise long ago that these lands were available to these people for these purposes. They need to withhold their end of the bargain. And those guys need to have a different seat at the table than a housewife in Detroit. And that's just the fact. Troy, you're much more talkative than the last time you were on this show. I'm just, I'm just saying, it's just We good. got him all fired up. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to take a break here on the county seat. When we come back, we'll have some final thoughts. We'll see you in just a second. The county seat would like to take a moment to express our appreciation for the service of Wayne County Commissioner Newell Harward. For the last seven years, he has been a tireless defender of public lands, rural Utah, and the county seat. I join with a chorus of many who wish him well in his retirement. Good luck, Newell. We love you. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking about the overhaul on grazing uh, across the BLM spectrum. Okay, it's, it's do or die time. This opportunity is not going to happen possibly again for another 25 years. So how do ranchers and, and, and users of the land need to participate? So there, there's going to be a website. And you can make your comments or you can send your own handwritten letters or emails or whatever else on. And, and I think that it's really important that us as local agencies and we kind of give you an, give individual ranchers an idea. So the, the process really is because public meetings are happening, but March 6, 2020 is the deadline, which means that uh, like a couple of weeks before that, 
or, or in the next couple of weeks, you need to get your comments in, uh, and you should make them to the county so the county can get them to the state so the state can organize them and put them out under the governor's signature, which has more weight. Is that, right. is that correct? That's true, yeah. but the individual ranchers themselves also need to make those comments yes. on their own. Talk about their personal problems, their issues that they've had over the years. You know, the time that they asked to get their permit renewed, and it took 10 years because of the roadblocks that BLM put in place. Those personal stories need to go directly. They need to go to that website where the link is and write those comments and talk about how it's affected them economically, how it's hurt their herd health, how it's made them difficult to operate. They need to make sure they take that time. So Kathleen, this review is gonna be done at a different level, obviously. A lot of guys will have experience at, at you know, a field office doing a grazing review. These comments are gonna go to an entirely different level of, of, of review, are they not? They will. They will go to senior officials within the BLM, which may actually reside in uh, Grand Junction. We may not have to deal with the Washington factor, but yes, there are going to be people in the agency that are professionals in that area, but they have risen up through the ranks. Do people need to be really eloquent, or, or can they just get the point across? No, they can use John Lang language all they want. Okay, and then you guys will, you guys will take it and, and rework it from and there. And they can also write their comments on paper and put a stamp on an envelope and send them. I think it means as much coming from an individual rancher or grazer, whether you're a wool grower or a cattleman's, whatever. I, it means just as much coming from an individual as... Probably more. All right, and, the, and now is the time to do it. This is something that they need to do in the next two weeks, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. Probably within a week of when your show airs. Yeah, there you go. Not two weeks. <laughs> okay. Well, local government is where your life happens. Be engaged, be involved, be part of the solution. Participate in this, please, and share this message as quickly as you can with your friends. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. And while we would love your comments right now on this particular topic, your comments need to be going to the BLM. And we'll see you next week on the county seat. Thank you for watching the county seat. Be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications to keep up to date on the program and happenings around Utah.